Mr. Ambassador, nice to talk to you, sir. Good to talk to you, Greta. Ambassador, in speaking with ex-president of Pakistan, Musharraf, now General Musharraf, uh, he told me that one of the reasons that the United States is having some diplomatic issues with Pakistan is because, in his view, the United States has favored India so much, that we've tilted in favor of India, and, of course, they are not friendly with India. What's your thought on that? Uh, this dynamic is as old as the two countries themselves are. It goes all the way back to partition and independence after World War II. Uh, Pakistan has existential issues, quite literally, with India. Uh, they, they fear that the day will come when the Indians, with their vastly superior numbers, will literally try to overrun them. So almost anything that happens in Pakistan is filtered through that, uh, that, that prism of, of India. The Indians do something similar uh, as a much larger country, not with the same degree of uh, urgency and angst, but uh, everything we do, the Pakistanis will look at it vis-a-vis -vis India, and that uh, certainly applies to the, uh, the nuclear issue and even more to Afghanistan, as uh, came out in your, uh, your interview with uh, General Musharraf. Well, they've been saber-rattling for years. Both, are both countries have nuclear weapons. Should we be alarmed, or should we just think this is sort of business as usual? Pakistan and India will always have a, a sort of a scuffle across the border and always be saying, you know, threatening things to each other. Uh, it's a little of both, but clearly uh, two major countries on terms of outright antagonism and both with nuclear weapons uh, it's not the kind of thing you want to look away from. So I, I think we have to be actively engaged uh, with both, uh, doing what we can to lower temperatures and uh, prevent uh, uh, occasional clashes from turning into something worse. Well, it appears that in Pakistan, like other parts of the world, most notably Africa, is that as, as the United States sort of distance itself diplomatically with Pakistan, China is increasingly putting an influence in Pakistan. Number one, do you agree with me that China is moving into Pakistan more? And number two, is should that be the least bit uh, alarming to the United States? Uh, those are two great questions, Greta. Um, uh, when I was in Pakistan as ambassador, that was 2004 to 2007, uh, my problem with China wasn't that they were doing too much, it was that they weren't doing enough. Uh, to, to use the weight of that uh, strategic relationship to uh, press Pakistan on their harboring of, uh, uh, of terrorists, for example. Uh, China has got some problems in its west, and uh, uh, some of those groups that are active there uh, shelter and train inside Pakistan. So. Uh, the relationship between the U.S. and China is large and complex. In some areas, we're going to be uh, competitors, even adversaries. In other areas, I think we can cooperate. And I would think Central Asia, especially with Pakistan, would be uh, one of those areas. So uh, it, it's not that they're going to push us out of Pakistan. Uh, it's that I wish they would be more meaningfully engaged in Pakistan and uh, influencing the uh, the leadership there in a positive direction. I, what you noted about the, how complex the relationship is, I always think that it's sort of, you know, I always think, how do I explain to people that on the one hand we're at odds with China, whether it be on trade or whether we think they're uh, too much influence in one part of the world. On the other hand, we, we think that they are helping us with, for instance, with Kim Jong-un in North Korea. And so we have such a, you know, sometimes we seem very friendly and we're pals, and other times we seem to be almost adversaries. Well, you've summed it up uh, exactly right, and I, it's not unusual. Uh, again, uh, we are both great powers. Uh, we both have uh, broad international agendas. At, at some points, our interests will intersect, and at others, they will compete or even collide. Uh, but again, I would suggest uh, Pakistan is one where cooperation uh, will uh, uh, be, be more significant and more important for us both than, uh, than any kind of uh, confrontation. Is there a way to describe the U.S. strategy, the Trump administration strategy in Afghanistan right now? Uh, there is. Uh, as you recall, last summer, President Trump addressed the Afghanistan-Pakistan uh, question. On Afghanistan, I thought he was quite good. Uh, 
he effectively said that uh, we have vital interests in Afghanistan, that um, uh, we are going to be in <clears throat> engaged there to support those interests, that we will be driven by <clears throat> conditions and not by calendars. I, I thought that was very important uh, given the way that uh, we've looked at the calendar first saying we'll be done by date certain rather than the conditions that brought us there in the first place. So I, I think he got that right and I think it was uh, fairly significant. I would also note for the record that um, in, in so doing he was really building on the, um, uh, the handover that President Obama made to him uh, you, you'll recall that toward the end of President Obama's term, he froze further troop withdrawals. Uh, and that allowed President Trump to, to say, uh, we're going to be staying until the conditions suit. On Pakistan, sadly, um, I don't think he got it right. Uh, uh, quite confrontational, talking about Pakistan, talking about uh, a hostile relationship. Um, that uh, pressure was going to have to be brought to bear. Um, that does not reflect uh, a realistic agenda. Well, the I, when, I won't you, when you do the pressure, though, I assume that means mostly money. Is that if, if we lift more of our money from Pakistan, then that's when we when China is invited in deeper. Uh, it, it is, and um, uh, as I said. I, I would like that to be the case. I would like to see China do more. Uh, when I was in Pakistan, for example, I made a special point of uh, visiting Gwadar, uh, where uh, China is involved in building a modern port facility and a, an infrastructure, rail and road, uh, to support it. Um, we were solidly behind that. Uh, and I, I went down to Gwadar to put on record that uh, this is not a point of competition between us, it's a point of cooperation. Uh, so if the Chinese are motivated to do more along these lines, um, that's great. But the problem that we, uh, that we face in Pakistan, that really China and the U.S. face, uh, is the insurgency in Afghanistan uh, that um, uh, Pakistan helps sustain by harboring the Taliban leadership. Let me, let me move to a neighboring country um, and talk about Iran and Saudi Arabia. Now that the United States has pulled out of the agreement, President Trump has, uh, has in, this, in essence, put the sanctions back on. Um, is, do you think Saudi Arabia is going to want a nuclear weapon? And what happens to the leadership in Iran? Is the U.S. really looking for a regime change, or what's its strategy? Well, like, uh, frankly, a lot of things with the, uh, the new administration, I'm, I'm hoping there is a strategy there, that we're not just playing this on the fly, and I sometimes think that's a, exactly what we're doing. Uh, look, nothing happens overnight on the, uh, the Iran nuclear agreement. Uh, we have given uh, uh, third parties 90 days to wrap up transactions in certain areas. Uh, uh, 180 days and others like the oil sector. There's going to be a lot of back and forth now, and it's already started with the, uh, the core European states uh, saying they are going to work to keep this agreement viable, and uh, Iran saying pretty much the same thing. So I think you're going to see, starting now, the beginning of a process more than the end. While everybody maneuvers for maximum advantage and uh, tries to see how to go forward. So I would not write this off yet. Um, nonetheless, I think it was a uh, seriously uh, negative and unfortunate step that the president took. Were you in favor of the agreement back in 2015, or did you think that it should have been a stronger agreement or no agreement? Uh, well, it, look, it was a negotiated agreement. As you know better than anyone uh, with, with your background that no negotiated agreement is ever going to be perfect from any party's perspective. So my take on it was uh, a pretty good arms control agreement. Um, I know nuclear uh, expert, but my friends who are said essentially that. Uh, what happened though was I think a tendency on some in the Obama administration to overinterpret it, to say this is the beginning of a, uh, a treaty of peace and friendship. Well, you know, it's no such thing. I, I, the parallel I draw goes back to the 1980s when Ronald Reagan negotiated some pretty important arms control agreements with the Soviet Union. Uh, 
That didn't stop him from referring to it as an evil empire and applying pressure everywhere else. Uh, that would have been a playbook that the Obama administration could usefully uh, had review to, uh, to, to push back in Iraq and Syria, uh, in Yemen, elsewhere, against uh, Iranian overreach rather than try to coddle them. So again, uh, a, a, a reasonably good arms control agreement it never was what some made it out to be, the beginning of a new era in U.S.-Iranian relations. And that, incidentally, that latter point, is what made um, our Saudi and Israeli friends uh, so nervous and uncomfortable. It, it wasn't the agreement per se. It was the way it was portrayed out of Washington as the beginning of a, um, of a new relationship between Tehran and Washington. Well, back in 2015, had it been a treaty, and of course, uh, President Obama couldn't have gotten it past the Senate, the two-thirds vote required to get the treaty, um, President Trump wouldn't be able just to sign his name and get rid of it. Um, so I'm wondering your thought with the fact that one president says he's in, another president comes along and signs something, and we're out. What message does that send to anyone else we might be negotiating a deal with, for instance, North Korea? Um, or is that, is that just part of diplomacy, or is this really sort of a serious defect in our ability to uh, make any agreement? Uh, it's, a, it's another great question. Yes, we are now doing uh, uh, policy by executive order. Uh, uh, President Obama set the record in his term. Uh, I think pretty clearly President Trump is going to exceed it because that's the only way the executive can get business done anymore. Congress is not going to pass uh, treaties. Uh, they're not going to pass anything really to do with the, um, uh, uh, the world outside our borders. So that which can be put into effect by a stroke of the pen can also be rescinded by the stroke of a pen, as we've seen. Uh, in terms of our relationships abroad, uh, it is deeply damaging. Uh, our friends, uh, worry that we are not going to have the continuity and strategic patience to maintain a course once it's set across administrations. And our adversaries now count on that, that uh, uh, if you don't like what the Americans are doing, just wait. They'll get tired. They'll get impatient. Domestic politics will intervene. Um, uh, they will shift focus. And then it's our turn, our chance to move. Not a good position for the United States to be in. Well, back in 2015, when it was first um, discussed and then, uh, then entered into by the United States and the other nations, there's all the attention on nuclear weapons, uh, miss missiles, and whether or not, the, you know, the, uh, whether or not uh, Iran would develop a missile system, a delivery system, um, and a sunset provision. But the, th but the thing that always caught my attention was the unfreezing of the assets, which gave an enormous amount of cash that belonged to the Iranians, but it had been frozen in the United States to the Iranians uh, that they then apparently didn't use to, in the countryside of Iran, because people have protested that they're not getting anything, but the money appears to have gone to Hezbollah, to, um, to fighting in Syria, to fighting in Yemen. Um, so it, it seems like that money has, has been used, a good bit of it, to cause more disruption and danger in the Middle East. Am I right or wrong? The money was, of course, their money. It, was, uh, it, it wasn't some reward they were given, it, simply the, the freeze on on their funds was lifted. Uh, and I, I think the conditions you describe really give us an opportunity. Did things get better for the average Iranian? Uh, do they have better schools now, better job opportunities? Uh, uh, all the indications are that they don't. And I think it's important to be getting the message across in, inside Iran that uh, uh, your government got access to X billions of dollars. How has that changed your life? Uh, well, it hasn't changed their lives at all, as far as we can tell. And, and getting that message uh, in there, uh, I think, is pretty important. Uh, with respect to Hezbollah and other Iranian proxies, whether uh, in Iraq or in Syria or even in Yemen, uh, they were not exactly starving for funds before the unfreezing of assets. The Iranians would find it somewhere. Um, so I don't really think I see a qualitative or quantitative difference uh, in those countries on, on the uh, part of Iranian militia assets before and after the freeze. They, they, were, they were supported no matter what. It's the Iranian people who pay for it, uh, obviously, and I think getting that message across inside Iran is, uh, is very important to us right now.
Okay, here's a random question, my last one, the one I've wanted to ask you a long time. You've been ambassador to so many nations representing the United States. What nation were you an ambassador to that you would have liked to have been an ambassador to and why? Um, well, I, I, got, uh, I got six of them, uh, uh, and that seemed like a good time to wrap it up. Uh, to be honest, Greta. I, but isn't I there one you sort symmetry? of thought, thought like, oh, if, if only I'd had like a seventh and it had been X country, you know, even, I don't know, everyone, I would think that uh, Paris sounds pretty good to live in, so uh, France, or you don't have any sort of uh, wishful thinking like that would have been fun? I, I, I really don't. Uh, you know, I, I love France. I en enjoy uh, a visit there every chance I get, but I would have been terrible uh, trying to work in France, uh, you know, let, like a lot of people in your line of work, the crises get in your bloodstream. You become kind of a crisis junkie, and uh, 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 that's, that's where I felt uh, I, I could do the best and um, uh, enjoy the uh, exhilaration that comes from doing hard things in hard places. Well, you certainly had the crisis countries and the hardest assignments. I'll give that to you. Apparently, you didn't like the easy ones. Anyway, Ambassador, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Greta.